Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, as Anne said, I'm Jared Simpson. I'm a principal investigator here at OICR. Uh, I have a lab upstairs on the sixth floor where we develop computational methods for processing and analyzing DNA sequencing data. Um, as part of my uh, appointment here at OICR, I also have an appointment over at the University of Toronto in the Department of Computer Science as a assistant professor in computer science where uh, I do some more theoretical work on developing methods for uh, analyzing very large collections uh, of data, like sequencing data that we're going to hear about. So I'm going to be with you for about the next four hours today. Um, we're going to talk about the two primary methods of analyzing DNA sequencing data, um, being either mapping reads to a very well characterized reference genome. This is what we usually do in, in, in cancer bioinformatics because we have human reference genome. In the second half of this uh, module, I'm going to talk about doing pure de novo assembly, so trying to reconstruct the genome sequence directly uh, from reads that come off, say, an Illumina sequencer. And for both of those halves, we're going to have mo uh, laboratory modules where you have a chance to run uh, some mapping programs and assembly programs as well. And in, in between, we'll have a break uh, just so I don't go on and on for four hours here. So for the first part of the lab, we, we want to talk about mapping reads to a reference genome. And what I hope you learn from this uh, is to understand what that process means. So I'll give you a little bit of insight into how the algorithms work for taking a set of sequencing reads off of, say, an Illumina sequencer, mapping them to the human reference genome. Uh, I'll introduce the FASTQ and the SAM and BAM file formats. Uh, these are the primary uh, files that you'll store on your computer that represent either sequencing data that's come off DNA sequencing instrument, or after you've aligned the reads to a reference genome, how we represent them in the SAM and BAM. I'll explain those to you in detail. Um, I'll describe some common terminology that we use to describe alignments and sequencing data, things like base quality scores, mapping qualities, uh, and then in the last part, you'll get a chance to run a mapper on your own uh, and explore the results. Uh, so I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about uh, how DNA sequencing works and the main DNA sequencing instrument that we now use, which is uh, the Illumina HiSeq or the Illumina X10 instruments. Um, so the human genome was sequenced using what's called Sanger sequencing, which was uh, sequencing chemistry developed in the 1970s. Um, it was fantastic. It, was, it allowed us to sequence the human genome, albeit at very great cost of billions of dollars. Um, but once we sequenced the initial uh, reference sample of a human genome, uh, there was this realization in the field that we needed to reduce the cost of sequencing such that we could sequence many, many genomes and discover a lot of genomic variation and then link that to the observable phenotypes uh, that we all have. So an example is here in cancer genomics. We want to be able to sequence uh, an individual's genome and see if they have particular germline SNPs or indels that predispose, uh, predispose them to getting cancer. Or if they get cancer, we want to extract DNA from their tumor samples, sequence it, find where the mutations are, and then link that to genes that might be driving the progression of the cancer. And in Trevor's lecture yesterday, I'm sure he told you about that process in a lot of detail. Now, the way that we do this nowadays is using what's called these Illumina sequencers. Now, Illumina is a second generation sequencer. It was a generation after Sanger sequencing, and we call it a massively parallel or a high throughput sequencing instrument. And the innovation in, in, in Illumina sequencing is that you could um, sequence many, many reads, many, many fragments of DNA in parallel using this imaging technique that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. The advantages of, of Illumina sequencing are that it gives you the best throughput by far. You get up to a terabase of DNA from a, a single Illumina run. The reads are incredibly accurate. The error rate is only a, le probably less than 1%, maybe 1 in 200 bases. And it gives you a pretty good read length for the second generation sequencers. Um, also, the library preparation is very fast and it's very robust, so it's quite easy to get high quality uh, Illumina data compared to some other sequencing instruments. Now the disadvantage of Illumina sequencing is this read length. Though. You can only read about 100 to 150 bases of DNA at a single time. And because the human genome is so large and so repetitive and something we're going to be coming back to again and again over 
uh, this morning is that that read length isn't enough to resolve a lot of the most difficult repetitive regions uh, of the human genome. So when we go back to, to talk about genome assembly a little later on, uh, I'll be introducing third generation or single molecule long read sequencers like the PacBio and the Oxford Nanopore that aim to get around this. But for cancer genomics, because we want to sequence so many samples, get power to find driver genes, uh, we typically use Illumina sequencing because it's so cheap and because you can sequence uh, a human genome for around $1,000 to $1,500. Now I'm going to walk you through how the Illumina sequencer works because I think it's incredibly important to understand the actual physical and the chemical processes that are going on so when you will analyze your own data and something doesn't quite look right you can go back and think about how, what the error modes of Illumina sequencing are and that might give you insight into uh, why you see some of the errors. Now, Illumina sequencing is called sequencing by synthesis. The, the original chemistry was developed by a company called Selexa, which, which was subsequently bought by Illumina. The way it works is you take your DNA samples, which contain many copies of your genome. These could just be uh, DNA that you extracted from white blood cells. You fragment that DNA into uh, a lot of small pieces, the pieces being between a few hundred to maybe 400 bases. And then you attach those DNA fragments, which we're going to call templates, uh, to the surface of a microscope slide. Now, at each position on the microscope slide, we have a single template molecule. And we're showing two examples here with template molecule, the sequence TACAC, and another one over here, it's a template sequence CAGGG. And what happens is in place on the slide, uh, there's process called bridge amplification or bridge PCR which amplifies from these uh, single molecule templates into a big cluster of the same uh, DNA sequence all in place. So these clusters here I'm showing them as being six, uh, six molecules. In practice they're more like something like 10 to 20,000 all in a bundle uh, lying in the same region of this microscope slide. So that's the library, that, that's the cluster generation step. Next, the sequencing starts. How this uh, works is you uh, inject color-labeled nucleotides. So these are nucleotides that have uh, a fluorophore that will emit light after being uh, excited with a laser. You have one color for each of the four different nucleotides, and you add DNA polymerase as well. And the DNA polymerase is going to find uh, the colored nucleotide that's complementary to the next base in these fragments. So here we're just drawing single molecules, pretend that these are clusters, and it's going to attach it into this growing strand of DNA. So here, found an A that's complementary to this T, found a G that's complementary to this C. The fluorophore gets excited by a laser, it emits light, a very, very expensive digital camera attached to a microscope, uh, images what color of light uh, was emitted, and then the sequencing reaction for that cycle ends, and then you proceed to the next base with another uh, uh, injection of the colored labeled nucleotides, addition of DNA polymerase, and then capturing of light. So each one of these steps, you're sequencing a single base sequentially in order down this DNA fragment. Yeah? If the error rate, is that a function of, it could be both, of the polymerase mismatching a base or the camera misdetecting the signal? I'm going to hang on to that because I'm going to talk about the error rate in two slides. Yeah? How, how does it? release the anti-send strand? Uh, during this step? Yeah, because I know the bridge, it goes like this, and then it anchors, and then it pops back up, yeah. and then it does that again. How does the anti strand not interfere with it? There, there's a step on there that will, uh, that will just get rid of it. I don't know the chemistry of how it actually, like during the bridge PCR, I don't know how it gets rid of the, the anti strand strand, whether it separates them or just one strand. Uh, goes away. Uh, I, I'll look that up and, and maybe ask, come back to you at the break. Okay, thanks. Okay, so in, in the fifth step, we're just going to line up all of the images, one for each cycle. So in the first cycle, we had a green flash of light for this cluster, a yellow flash of light for this one. In the second cycle, we had red, red. In the third, third uh, yellow, blue, and so on. And the base color is going to take these images, try to detect where the cluster is across the five different images. So it's going to say, okay, this is the, 
leftmost cluster across these five and then predict what color of light was in each one of these images. So say green, red, yellow, red, yellow. And that would be, that would then get turned into the base called sequence for that DNA fragment. So it knows what color nucleotide is green and so on. Now coming back to the question we just had um, about the errors of Illumina sequencing. Now the primary error mode is due to what we call uh, phasing or dephasing problems. Now, because we have this cluster of 10 to 20,000 molecules, all that are being sequenced simultaneously, um, as the reaction progresses, some fragments, some molecules in that cluster are either going to lag behind the sequence reaction or they're going to jump ahead. And by that, we mean that when we're on sequencing cycle two, we might have some molecules that didn't get a base incorporated in the first cycle, so they're lagging behind by a step, or they got too many bases incorporated in that cycle, so they've jumped ahead to this G base. Now what happens, the effect of this is that the signal that we capture with these digital cameras becomes a mixture of the different colors. So here we have two molecules in this cluster which emitted a red light for this T. We had one that emitted green and one that emitted yellow. Now, the, what we'd register here is a signal that's 50% red, 25% green, and 25% yellow. And the base caller has to deal with this in some way. It has to try to deconvolve this signal to figure out that, okay, this red, green signal is because there's a fragment that's lagging behind, and this orange signal is uh, because this fragment has jumped ahead. Now, early in the cycle, the color is very pure. We'd get mostly the, same, uh, mostly the same color for every one of these templates. But as the sequencing uh, process uh, continues towards the three prime end of the fragment, towards the end of the read, the later cycles, more and more templates are going to fall out of sync. So you get uh, an impure signal near the end of the DNA sequencing fragment. And this is what gives you the characteristic Illumina error rate, where the sequencing error rate is very low at the beginning of the read, and that increases as you go to the three prime end of the read. Now the base caller has fairly sophisticated probabilistic models to deal with this. It's gonna try to model this process of uh, fragments either falling behind or jumping ahead. And it's going to try to, to, to deconvolve these mixed signals, but it's also going to give you a confidence level in how sure it is about the assignments of the base calls. So when it says, okay, in the second cycle here, I think there's a T, it's going to give you what we call a quality score, which measures uh, the, the base caller's confidence in whether there is a there's an error at that position. So the quality scores are directly proportional to the error rate uh, that you observe at that position. So the main file format that you have uh, your sequencing data in is called the FASTQ format. Uh, this file format has four lines per read or per record, and uh, each one of these lines describes uh, something about the sequencing read. So the very first line, in this example we have five sequencing reads, four lines per uh, read, so 20 lines total. The first line is, has uh, an at symbol at the start of it to delimit the record. That's just a marker saying that this is the start of the FASTQ record. Then has the read ID following uh, that at sign. So this is just uh, an identifier for the read, the, the Lumina instrument um, assigned to that cluster. Next we have the nucleotide sequence that was predicted by the base caller. So this is about 100 bases here. These are the bases that were predicted for every cycle of that sequencing reaction. The third line uh, is a placeholder. It's just a plus sign. Sometimes the sequencing read ID is duplicated in this field. In modern FASTQ though, it's usually just a plus uh, without any other information. And then the fourth line is the string of quality values. Uh, which is shown here, where it goes HHH all the way down to these uh, number signs here. Now, these quality values, as I just said, uh, reflect the base caller's confidence in the assignment of those bases. So for the A base that it called in the first cycle, it assigned a quality value of H. Now, 
uh, it's not very intuitive to turn H into a probability that there is uh, an error at that site. But the way that FASTQ format is encoding this information is using what's called a FRED score, which is a numerical ver uh, value for the quality, uh, the quality value that's then turned into one of these printable ASCII ta uh, characters. And you can go online and look up uh, FASTQ on Wikipedia, and it will give you a table mapping from one of these character codes back to what the FRED score is for the base. So these FRED scores are estimates of the probability the base is incorrect, and this is just a table of the different, um, of a uh, sampling of FRED scores and mapping to their probability the base is incorrect. So a base quality score of three, which is very low probability, has about a 50% chance that the observed base is incorrect. Base quality score of 10 has a 10% chance uh, the observed base is incorrect. Quality score of 40 is about a 1 in 10,000 chance that the base is incorrect. Now, typical Illumina data will, the average quality score will be between 30 and 40. Um, so about 0.1 to 0.01% chance the bases are incorrect. But the base quality scores are going to draw up towards the three prime end of the read because of the chance that these uh, signals go out of phase. And, okay, so that's um, description of Illumina. Do we have any questions about Illumina at this point? Did I answer your question about the errors? Uh, it's just one problem. It gives you the probability error. Right? Could, could it tell you what other base pairs it could be? Like it, it could be a T with one in a thousand, but it's, it could be also maybe a C, but definitely not an A. Like a. Yeah, it's a good question. The, when Illumina sequencing first became available, the image files, like these, these images of the, of the flow cell were kept, and you could go back and look at the images or, or get software that would go back over the images and make alternative base calls at every position. Um, unfortunately, these image files are huge, so the field decided collectively that we we're gonna throw out the image data as it's being generated, just so you don't have this multiple terabyte files coming out of your uh, uh, sequencing run. So essentially, because you lose that information, because the Lumina base caller is not designed to make alternative base calls, it will just tell you I think there's a T here, and here's a probability that it's incorrect. Uh, you don't have that alternative information, unfortunately. Uh, one, one extension of that, though, is that the error modes of Illumina sequencing are, are quite well understood. We know that if there's a T error um, with certain probability that it might have been a C instead because of how the floor for spectrum overlap, but typically that lower level information is only used in things like very sophisticated variant callers, um, and it's not used by um, like people who are just looking at looking at their own primary data. <coughs> so the rest of this uh, lecture is going to be about mapping reads to a reference genome. And then uh, in later modules of this course, um, other instructors will, will take these ideas of mapping reads to a reference genome and describe to you how uh, that's used to find genetic variation like SNPs, somatic mutations, copy number variation, uh, and so on. <clears throat> now, the human genome is incredibly large. We can think of it as a 3 billion nucleotide string. And Illumina reads are very short. They're only about 100 base pairs in length. So to discover variation, we want to compare reads to their corresponding position on the reference genome, the position where that read may have come from, and then look for differences in the alignment. So if you have our reference here, we have our read here, we see that there's a mismatch here where the reference has a C and the read has a T. This is a candidate SNP position. It also might be a sequencing error. By taking many, many reads overlapping the same position, we'd be able to differentiate between the two. But the part of this process I'm going to talk about, and others are going to cover how this exact variant pro calling process works, is just finding where this read matches on the reference genome. It could have come from any one of three billion different places in the reference genome. And we need to find the exact one or the set of possible mappings of that read onto the reference. So to do this, we need to figure out where the read best matches the reference. And this is what we call the mapping problem. Now I'm going to go over some of the challenges of mapping reads to the reference genome. The primary one is that the genome is incredibly large and repetitive. The human genome is roughly 50% repeats where the sequence is 
present in multiple copies spread throughout the genome. Uh, the main repeats are caused by retrotransposons, uh, which have copied themselves along the genome uh, over millions of years. <clears throat> and because the genome is so repetitive, naive algorithms that just look for uh, simple matches between a read and the reference genome are going to take too much time. So the most naive mapping algorithm you could think of is to take our read, compare it against every position of the reference genome, sliding left to right, as if you're just scanning down uh, the pages of a book for a certain sentence, and if it matches there, we omit that mapping location, otherwise we just move along. Um, for the amount of sequencing data that we get from an Illumina sequencer, this sort of algorithm wouldn't work. So we need to work with much more clever uh, techniques which build what we call indexing data structures of the reference genome to very quickly screen out uh, unsuccessful matches. And the key aspect of developing these indexing data structures is that we need to efficiently avoid aligning a read to all different copies of these repetitive regions. And there's been hundreds, if not thousands, of papers written about this topic of how we can efficiently align very short reads to a repetitive reference genome. And this is the type of problem uh, that my computational lab works on. So the second thing a read mapper needs to take in mind is that reads contain sequencing errors and SNPs and indels. So something we might want to do is just look for exact matches between our reads and the reference genome, like a program like GREP might do. But because we have these sequencing errors that accumulate in reads, and because the reads differ from the reference genome in, at places where there's SNPs and indels, the mapping program needs to be tolerant of these differences between uh, the reads and the reference genome. So I gave you an example of where there was a single base mismatch, shown again here, where there's, there's this possible C to T substitution. And here's a slightly more difficult case where there's uh, a deletion in the read of the C base, an insertion of these TC dinucleotide here. Now, when you go to map your own data, um, you should understand that tolerating substitutions, like these type of differences, where there's just a difference in the identity of the base, is much easier for the mapping program than tolerating these insertion and deletion mutations. And the effect of that is that when you go to do things like SNP or indel calling or SMAC mutation detection, the accuracy of finding SNPs or substitutions is much better than the accuracy of finding insertions and deletions, just because it's so much harder to map reads with insertions and deletions than it is to map uh, reads with just substitution. So in earlier versions of this, uh, this course, I've gone over different mapping algorithms and talked about uh, the various properties of, of a good mapper. Now, this was a daunting task because, as I said, this was an incredibly active area of computational biology research, and literally hundreds of mappers have been published over the last 10 years with different speed, sensitivity, and accuracy trade-offs. Uh, luckily for us, the field has now settled on using one mapping algorithm, um, so we're only going to uh, learn about that one today. And that mapper is called BWA MEM. Uh, this is a program written by Hang Lee when he was at the Sanger Institute. He's now at the Broad Institute. Um, the reason it's become the standard way of mapping Illumina reads to a reference genome is that it's very well supported. Um, Hang is actively updating BWA to fix bugs. There's a huge community of users so that if you uh, need to ask a question, a lot of people have experience working with this mapper. Uh, also, most of the downstream tools that we're going to be working with, like the SNP callers and the somatic mutation callers, uh, expect alignments that come out of this program. So they're optimized to take alignments from BWA MEM. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, the, the main problem when mapping reads to reference genomes is we need to efficiently handle all the repeats that occur in the reference. And BWA MEM uses a data structure called the FM index, which is also sometimes called the Burroughs Wheeler transform, um, to avoid mapping reads um, to all copies of the repeat uh, individually. So it organizes the reference genome into this data structure, which is closely related to what we call a suffix tree, which allows you to take a read and align to all different copies of a repeat simultaneously. And this is what gives BWA MEM uh, its great speed. 
going into how this mapping algorithm works and how the fmindex works is a little bit too much for this course. But if anybody's really interested in, in, in the details of how read mappers uh, operate under the hood, I'd be happy to go over that uh, during the lab session. So we talked a little bit about base quality scores, which is the base caller's estimate that uh, a base call is incorrect. Now, there's a corresponding concept in mapping, which is called mapping qualities. And what mapping qualities try to do is that it tries to assess how reliable an individual mapping is. Now, coming back to this idea of how repetitive the human genome is, um, even though we have 100 base pair reads, which can cover 90% of the genome uniquely, there's still a lot of sequence in the human genome that can't be covered uniquely by a 100 base pair read. So when BWA MEM takes it, the reads, maps them to the reference genome, it might have multiple candidate mapping locations that have very similar alignments or very similar uh, scores. And it's going to need to decide what the true alignment is between these different possible alignments. So here's an example here. We have a very short read, which is just shown for illustration. It has two candidate mapping locations, one to chromosome 10, where there's a single base pair substituted. The reference has a T, the read has an A. And one to chromosome 2, where there's two base pairs substituted. The reference has GT, and the read has TC. Now, if BWMM found these two possible mappings, it needs to decide what the true mapping is and give you some level of confidence in that. So it's going to calculate this mapping quality score, which just like a base quality score, is a Fred scaled probability that the mapping the BWA MEM chooses is incorrect. And the way that it calculates this is that it's going to use the base quality scores to decide whether these mismatches it observes are sequencing errors or true SNPs and then weigh the two mappings against each other. So is a mapping with one mismatch at this position more likely to be true than a mapping with two mismatches at this position? So BWMM takes the, all the possible math and b mappings, looks at the quality scores around these differences, and then it assigns this probability score to each one. And it outputs that into the SAM and BAM file as this mapping quality. So this one, it would assign a mapping quality of 10, and just like we saw in that base quality score, that means there's about a 10% chance that that mapping is incorrect. Now, complicating this is that sometimes when a read matches a very repetitive region of the genome, we might have two mappings that are exactly equivalent. And there's no information to resolve them. So here we have another read. And it maps to chromosome 16. And it maps to chromosome 3. And they both have a mismatch in the same position. So in the absence of no other information, we can't say anything about what one of these two mappings might be correct. We say that these reads are perfectly ambiguous. You can't pick chromosome 16 or chromosome 3 as the correct position for where this read might have come from. So in this situation, and this is sort of a BWA gotcha, something that's not intuitive that, that people get uh, confused about when they first start working with mapping data, BDRA MEM is just going to pick one of these two positions randomly. So it's just going to select one at random and output that as the mapping for the read. It doesn't output the alternative mapping. It doesn't say that this read could have also come from chromosome 3 if it picked chromosome 16. But what it's going to do is set its mapping quality to 0, which flags that the mapping is perfectly ambiguous and you can't trust it at all. Now, downstream programs like the mutation callers, in particular copy number variant callers uh, that you hear about this afternoon, are designed to uh, tolerate these mapping quality zero reads. When you're looking at your sequencing data, and if you're looking for somatic mutations, and you see a bunch of reads that show somatic mutation with a mapping quality of zero, you should automatically think, OK, I'm not going to trust these reads as much as reads that have a higher mapping quality. Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. It, right now, it wouldn't. So if, if it, there's a, um, so the question was, if, if it's known that this is a SNP on chromosome 16, that there's an A SNP at this location, but there isn't a known SNP 
on chromosome 3, would BWMM be able to resolve that by saying this position is more likely to be the alternative allele that we know is segregating in the population? BWMM doesn't do that. It only has a view of this fixed single reference genome. Um, there's a lot of people, though, that are working on new strategies for mapping reads to a reference genome, which use what we call population reference graphs, where rather than representing the reference genome as a single string, it represents reference genome as a graph data structure where branches in the graph denote where there's variation within the reference. So a population reference would in principle be able to resolve that by leveraging this extra information that we know there's a polymorphism uh, at that position. But right now, um, those methods are very much still in development. My group works on this, a uh, graduate student works on this, but um, they're not yet ready for people to use it at a very large scale. Yeah? Could you elaborate a little bit on why uh, downstream tools do use these with all these zeros and just the shape of the Still some information there. It's, it's mainly for copy number variation prediction. So the main way that we detect copy number variation is that we look at read depth along the genome. And if you have a duplicated region of the genome, you expect twice as many reads in this region. Um, and by randomly selecting one of the reads from the possible mapping, that kind of even out, evens out the coverage across all copies of the repeat that it could have come to. Yeah, so if you had a, if you had, um, if, it's a, if it's a copy number variant of just the repetitive region, we're not going to be able to detect that because exactly like it would smooth it out. If it's a copy number variant of, say, a megabase of the genome, which is a mixture of unique and repetitive sequence, then it, it you wouldn't lose all your depth in the repetitive regions, but you'd smooth the copies uh, across them, so you'd still be able to pick that up. This was one of the, like, when mapping algorithms were first developed, like, this was a big point of discussion of how do we deal with these, these very repetitive regions and these repetitive mappings. Because in principle, the thing you might want to do is catalog all of the possible locations that this read mapped to. Unfortunately, for very high copy repeats, like simple uh, sequences, like CG dinucleotides or uh, homopolymers of length 1,000, the number of possible mapping locations of a read that consists of only A's is going to be in the millions. And it's just impractical to output all possible mappings. So this idea of just randomly selecting them to sort of smooth the coverage across all copies uh, became you know, the best compromise. Is the mapping quality ever borrow information from other reads? Because here this example is just the reference. Is your um, that? It doesn't. So, so each read is treated by the mapper independently. Um, so it, it wouldn't look at other reads to try to resolve this, with the caveat that I'm just about to explain. Okay. okay. So uh, when we first had Illumina sequencing, or sele when it was still known as Selexa sequencing, the read length was about 27 bases. Then it increased to 36 bases. Now it's about 100 bases. But for a long time, we were working with 36 base pair reads. And the number of ambiguous mappings for a 36 base pair read to a very large reference like human was very, very high. We didn't have a lot of unique coverage across the whole genome. I think something like 80% of the, the genome could be covered uniquely by 36 base pair reads. So Lumina uh, developed. Uh, a chemistry trick to increase the number of unambiguous mappings we can get. And uh, this is done using what we call paired end reads, where we take a DNA fragment of length about 400, and we take an Illumina read from one end, an Illumina read from the other end, and then we don't know the sequence in the middle. But what the mapping program can do is it knows that these two reads are from the same source fragment of DNA, and it knows that the two ends should be around 400 base pairs apart. So it can constrain the alignments using this information to uh, help resolve some of these ambiguous mappings. So here's how BWMM would map paired end read. Let's go back to this example where we had this ambiguous mapping to chromosome uh, 16 and chromosome 3. There's no information to figure out which is a true mapping. Now, if we sequence reads in pairs, 
and the sequence of re this reads pair is here, we can map that pair to a nearby location, uh, roughly the size of our DNA fragment length, and then see whether the, there's a good mapping for it downstream of the first half of the pair. So in this case, there's a mapping to chromosome 16 where there's a single mismatch, but when we look at chromosome 3, there's many mismatches. So by sequencing this distant piece of DNA, or this distant end of the DNA fragment, we're able to resolve this, and then the mapping to chromosome 16 becomes unambiguous because it's constrained by this good mapping for the pair. Um, so is this clear to everybody? So when you work with sequencing data now, Illumina, all Illumina data comes in paired and reads. It's very, very rare unless you're doing things like RNA-seq um, or some other assays to sequence single-ended reads. You'll almost always have paired in reads. We've sequenced 100 base pairs from one end of the DNA fragment, 100 base pairs from the other, and then the mapping algorithm is going to try to place them together to resolve some of these ambiguous mappings. Okay, in the last few minutes of this lecture, before we get into the, the lab, I'm going to go over uh, the main file format that we use to store mappings and alignments. Um, so early in high-throughput sequencing bioinformatics, every mapping program output its own file format with its slightly different and slightly inconsistent behavior. Uh, as I said, there's hundreds of different mapping programs developed, and this was a bit of a nightmare for the field because you'd have to write converters to take the output from mapper A to put it into SNP caller B, uh, and vice versa. So everybody got together, realized that this was silly, and they decided that they'd make a standardized file format that everybody could write their sequence alignments into, and then all of the downstream tools that we work with, like the SNP callers and the somatic mutation callers, would take this standard file format uh, as input. So the file format that was developed was called the Sequence Alignment Map Format, or SAM for short. It comes in two variants. SAM is a human readable text format, and there's a record from the SAM format shown down here. Um, SAM is useful for if you want to examine the alignment yourself as a quality control or just pull out some information like where the reads map. Uh, but primarily the, read, the alignments are stored in what we call the BAM format, which is a binary file format that is much more efficient to store on disk and read into uh, these downstream SNP callers, mutation callers. Um, and later in the tu tutorial, we'll look at some command line tools you can use to convert between SAM and BAM. So I'm going to walk you through each one of the different fields in the SAM file format now. So the first field here, SRR013667.1, is the read ID. So this comes directly from that first line in the FASTQ file, which had that at symbol, which is just a unique identifier uh, for the read. The second field is what we call the flag. This is uh, a numerically encoded bit array, which gives uh, information about whether the read came from the reference strand or the reverse complement of the reference strand, if the read came with a pair, and whether the pair was mapped successfully. This isn't a human readable field. You can't go from a, a flag of 99 and say, OK, this mapped to the reverse complement strand. You need to use a converter to do this. And in the last slide of this, I link to uh, a page on the Broad Institute where you can put in this numerically encoded flag, and it will tell you which bits are set and what those bits mean. The next two fields are the chromosome and start coordinate of the mapping that was selected. So this read was mapped to chromosome uh, 19 at this position. The fifth field is this mapping quality. So mapping quality is always uh, higher is better. A mapping quality of 60 is the upper threshold. This means that PDRA MEM had incredibly high confidence that this is a unique, correct alignment, um, where the, the probability this is incorrect is something like 1 over 10 to 6. Uh, so there's a lot of confidence that PDRA had that this is a correct mapping. Uh, the next field is what we call the cigar string. So the mapping is, uh, gives you the coordinates of where the mapping starts, and the cigar string tells you how the bases of the read line up against the bases of the reference genome. Um, 
And this is a slightly obscure format. It's designed to be a compact representation of where the gaps in the alignment are. So the cigar string for a couple example alignments is down here. So here's our reference sequence. Here's our read sequence. There's a gap in the read, which is shown by this bar here. And the cigar string is 4M, says there's four matches between the read and the reference, here, 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 and here. Then there's one deletion from the reference, so this T needs to be deleted. And then there's six matches between the reference and the read sequence here. So using the cigar string, and the example one up here is 76 matches, the snip caller can take that cigar string and figure out which base on the read matches which base on the reference genome. Here's another example of a cigar string uh, where there's an insertion into the read. So again, we have 4M, 1I showing that insertion, 4M for these matches. Now, I purposely drew a substitution difference here where there's this AT. The cigar string only tells you the bases between the reference and the read that line up each, against each other. It doesn't tell you whether the same nucleotide or not. So you can't just take this and say that there was a single uh, mismatch at the second position. You have to actually parse the first four bases of the reference, first four bases of the read to say that there is a snip there, or a substitution there. And all tools will have uh, uh, code to, to do that comparison. Okay, the next field all the next fields all deal with this paired end information. So we have the chromosome of the other half of the read pair. It's an equal sign if it mapped to the same chromosome. So in this case, they both map to chromosome 19. Then the position of the read pair, and then the insert or the fragment size, which is the inferred length of that piece of DNA that was sequenced based on the alignment to the reference genome. And the remaining two fields are just the read sequence as it was seen in the uh, FASTQ file, and the base quality scores as well. The insert size is between the beginning of the first leg until the beginning of the other first leg? Yeah. Or it's the size of the um, So we, you, it's, it's, it's the full length size. I, I should change this. The, the, the proper terminology and the more clear terminology that, that the SAM file format uses is the template length which is the size of the complete DNA molecule end-to-end. -end. Um, it's also commonly referred to insert size, but I realize that there's some confusion around uh, that term of whether it refers to the unsequenced distance or the entire length of the fragment. But in this field it refers to the entire length of the DNA fragment. Okay, uh, before we move into uh, the lab, just a few more uh, resources and then a few slides. And I, oh, sorry. I have a small question about the practical. Um, when I'm uh, doing the analysis, I have to look at the genome file from the first uh, sequencing. <coughs> and can I merge the, the BAM files from the, the two other sites? So, y usually you want to um, tell BWA MEM that both reads came from the, 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 the same pair. Um, so there's two ways you can do this, and, and we'll see one of the ways when we map reads in the tutorial. Um, you can either have the read pairs in the same FASTQ file, where the first read of the pair is in the one record, and then in the next record is the other read in the pair. And So usually your sequencing data will come off the Illumina instrument in a particular format, and it will tell you that all of the reads from the first half of the pair are in this file, all the reads from the second half of the pair are in this file, and then you give it to B, you give those two files to BWA MEM, and it will figure out where the pairs are and do it all automatically. Now the reason this is important is that if you map, say, the first half of the pair with BWA MEM, and then a second run of BWA MEM around the second half of the pair, BWA MEM wouldn't be able to, to use the information between them. So it needs to be told which reads go together during the mapping step. Okay, so when I Yeah. yeah. It's the same situation? Um, it's, okay, it's, it's slightly different. Um, BDOA ALN will write out um, an intermediate file format, and it writes one of those intermediate file formats for both the first pair and the second pair. 
and then a subsequent step takes in the pair of intermediate file formats and outputs a SAM file. Um, but B2A mem internalizes all of that. I, I encourage you to use B2A mem if you can. Just everything's moved to B2A mem. Um, and it does a lot better with 100 base pair reads and, and thing, aligning around indels. Um, B2A mem internalizes all that. You just give it the two halves of the pair and two fastq files, or one interleaved fastq file, and then it handles it automatically. But yeah, you're right, B2A ALM need, needs to handle it a little bit differently. And I'll, I can talk to you a little bit more about that if you're interested in details. Any more questions before I move on? Okay, so here's some links and resources. So SAM Tools is the primary toolkit for working with SAM and BAM files. Um, there's a program called SAM Tools View, which will convert from SAM to BAM and vice versa. You can also sort a BAM file by its alignment coordinate or the read name, and you can also use it to extract reads for given alignment. Uh, given reference region or genomic location, if you're only interested in doing, say, variant calling uh, at a particular gene. Um, if there's anything that you think is ambiguous or you, you don't understand about a SAM file, you can go directly to the SAM and BAM specification, which is linked here, which is a technical document describing which one, each one of those fields means. Uh, if you run into trouble, there are a lot of different resources for asking for help. There's a sound to a help mailing list. Biostars and Seek Answers both have uh, large communities of experienced users who can help out. And finally, um, there's a link here to decoding that flag field where you can put in the numerical value of a flag and it'll tell you uh, which bits are set and what all of them mean uh, at that link. And I encourage you, when you're looking at your, your files later on, to go to that um, web page and, and have a look at what these flags mean. Okay, so uh, the last few slides here are just going to be um, an example of some alignment issues that you might see when working with real data uh, that you should be aware of. So have you had an IGV tutorial already? You have? Okay, great. So you're all now familiar with this screen. So this is um, IGV for a tumor normal pair. So the tumors on the bottom, normals up on the top. Each one of these gray bars is a read aligned to a reference genome, and the color of the gray bar um, indicates its mapping quality. So this moderate shade of gray here indicates that these reads mapped with very high mapping qualities. If the re reads mapped with low mapping qualities, they'd be a lighter shade of gray. If they mapped with a mapping quality of zero, meaning they're completely ambiguous, they would be white bars here. So you could automatically look at them and then downweight the evidence that uh, you think there's a mutation there. So IGV draws substitution mismatches as a colored nucleotide. And we see here in this tumor sample, there's uh, very good evidence for a substitution here. Then there isn't the corresponding evidence for that substitution uh, in the individual's normal. So a good somatic mutation caller would take this, look at the high level of evidence for this substitution, look at all these mapping qualities, which have quite high mapping qualities, and call a somatic mutation at this position, which is a C to D, G substitution. So you might run into regions of genome that look like this. This is uh, an incredibly awful picture of reads aligned to a reference genome. When I look at a, ref, uh, a, a screen of reads aligned to a reference genome, what you want is roughly uniform coverage of reads across the genome. Here we have these huge spikes in coverage where there's a lot of reads and there's these jagged coverage here. And we can see there's probably something odd going on in this reference genome just based on the huge variation in coverage here. Now the reason is this is if you look up here at this diagram of the chromosome, this red bar indicates where this window is and we're right at the beginning of the centromere of chromosome 2. And the centromeres are incredibly repetitive, and they're very difficult to map reads to. Um, so you, we, Peter Ray Mem has struggled to accurately place reads at this region of the reference genome. So I would automatically look at this and think that none of the variants that are seen here are probably true. They're just uh, artifacts from the mapping process. So finally, you might get reads that look like this. Sorry. Um, here, BWA MEM has only been able to align the start of some of these reads, and then it's performed what's called a soft clip on the reads 
where the end of the read hasn't aligned to the reference genome. And in this view of IGV, the soft clip bases are shown up as these multicolored tails of the reads here. Now what's happened here is there's a very large insertion, uh, sorry, deletion mutation in this tumor sample that isn't present in the normal. But because the deletion is so large, BDOA mem wasn't able to map reads that span across that deletion. So it's only lined reads up to the point at which um, the deletion starts, and then it discarded the rest of the reads by emitting what is called a soft clip. And these soft clip characters are denoted in these cigar strings with an S code, and uh, some programs that look for in somatic mutation, uh, indel mutations, will take those soft clip reads, try to perform a little local assembly around here to gain evidence that that's a true mutation. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now, and uh, we're going to go into the read mapping exercise. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody. So this lecture is a new addition to the cancer bioinformatics course. Um, there's a growing need for doing genome assemblies to characterize both novel species that, that don't have a good <laughs> reference genome. I was chatting with someone uh, just in a break about this, but also to look at the more highly rearranged parts uh, of cancer genomes. So we decided to add this new lecture, uh, which gives a high level overview uh, of how genome assembly works in the case where you don't have a reference, where you don't have a very good reference. Uh, so just to motivate what genome assembly is, here's how I view this genome assembly process. We've got our genome, which is made up of a mixture of unique and repetitive sequence. Again, I'm, uh, visualizing the repetitive sequence using these red bars. We fragment uh, many copies of our genome. We randomly sample DNA fragments and we determine their sequence with DNA sequencing instruments. And then the genome assembly process is to take those randomly sampled fragments and reconstruct the genome using just the sequence of those fragments uh, that we found. So in the mapping lecture, I gave this analogy of mapping as trying to find a sentence in a book by just flipping through the pages of the book and trying to match up that sentence. With genome assembly, we're going to take our book, we're going to take many copies of it, put it into a paper shredder, shred it into a lot of pieces, dump it on the floor, and then try to just look at those fragments of the book and reconstruct uh, what each page says. This is a much, much harder problem than just scanning through and trying to find matches. But in the case where we don't have a reference genome, this is the best we can do. Now the assembly problem is very close to my heart. This is what I've spent most of my career looking at. I uh, wrote an assembler called ABYSS when I was at the BC Genome Science Center out in Vancouver, and then continued working on genome assembly algorithms uh, during my PhD in the UK. Um, I'm going to talk in uh, about three different parts here. I'm going to talk about how assemblers work, uh, sort of a high-level theory of assembly. I'm then going to talk about assembly algorithms for short reads, like Illumina reads that we've already discussed, and long emerging sequencing platforms like the PacBio and the Oxford Nanopore sequencers, which can sequence much longer fragments of DNA, often in excess of uh, 10,000 bases. And then finally, I'm going to give an overview of what genomic features make short read assembly difficult and how we can measure them and assess them uh, prior to actually and setting off on a genome assembly. So we talk about assembly using whole genome shotgun sequencing data, and whole genome shotgun sequencing, or WGS, uh, takes our input genome, many copies of the input genome, it fragments it into many pieces randomly. This is the shotgun step. It refers to as if you just blasted the genome into uh, billions of pieces, and then to figure out what the sequence of each one of those pieces is using a DNA sequencing instrument. So at the end, we've got all of our fragments, which are sequence reads that we're going to try to use to reconstruct what that original genome sequence was. Now, if we knew the ordering of these fragments along the genome, if we knew, for example, that this read came from the leftmost position of the genome, and then this read came from the fifth position of the genome, and all the way along, if we know this total ordering of the sequences, genome assembly is actually very easy. We could just look at the base at each position, 
and put that into our output sequence to reconstruct the genome. Unfortunately, because of the shotgun nature of genome sequencing, because we've done this random fragmentation process, we don't know where these reads came from. We don't have this total ordering of the DNA fragments across the genome that allows us to reconstruct the sequence easily. We need to compute this and infer what the ordering of the reads are uh, computationally. And this is where uh, labs like mine come in, where we work on algorithms to efficiently do this. Now, key term involved with genome sequencing, and indeed with reference mapping as well, is the coverage of your genome. So the coverage of the genome is a measure of how redundantly you've sampled the genome. Usually it's short for the average coverage, which is the average number of reads covering a particular position in a genome. So we calculate that coverage by summing up the total number of bases that we've sequenced here. It's 177 in these blue reads here. And we divide that by the length of our genome. Here it's 35 nucleotides, 177 divided by 35 is about 7. So we say we have 7x coverage of this genome. Uh, we could also refer to coverage as the number of reads crossing a particular base of our uh, genome. Here the coverage of this T is about is 6 because we have 6 reads uh, that cover this position. Now, when doing any sort of sequencing analysis, uh, the coverage of your genome is incredibly important. If you want to find somatic mutations, you need a lot of sequencing coverage to discover whether a somatic mutation is a true mutation versus sequencing error noise. If you have a position of the reference genome that's covered by a single read, and there's a mismatch in that read, even with a high quality score, you're not going to trust that that's uh, a true somatic mutation. You need multiple reads covering each position of the genome to give redundant or multiple evidence that there's a mutation there. Similarly, when we're trying to do a genome assembly, we want high coverage because we need the reads to overlap to be able to, dis to determine whether they come from the same position of the genome by sharing very similar sequences. So the basic principle of genome assembly is that the more similar two reads are, the more likely they are to have come from overlapping stretches of the genome. So if we sequence a genome with 100 base pair reads to 50x coverage, we expect the reads to overlap by about 90 bases or more. And if we find 90 base pair overlap between reads, and overlap is where the end of one read matches the beginning of another, we can infer that they might have come from the original, the same original or overlapping pieces of a reference genome, and then we could stitch them back together uh, to reconstruct that little bit of the reference. Now, genome, genome assembly software formalizes this notion of using sequence similarity or overlaps between reads to reconstruct uh, our reference genome. So, the genome assembly field developed when Sanger sequencing uh, was invented by Fred Sanger in the 1970s. Uh, the first genomes were essentially reconstructed manually by comparing Sanger uh, sequencing gels to each other. It became pretty obvious, though, that automated or uh, software-based sequence assemblers would be needed for assembling larger genomes, like bacterial genomes. And the first methods for automating assembly uh, were developed for fairly long reads, Sanger reads are around 1,000 bases that had a moderate error rate. Um, the field then developed into devising all new methods for short read sequencing, uh, like Illumina sequencing, which had 100 base pair reads, very high accuracy, very, very high throughput. And we worked on short read assembly for about five or six years, but with the invention of the PAC file and the Oxford nanopore sequencers that can sequence greater than 10,000 base pair reads with higher error rate, the methods that we developed for Sanger sequencing or the field developed for Sanger sequencing are now back to being used uh, for these long read sequencing platforms. So as I describe the two assembly algorithms, I'm going to first describe the assembly algorithms were developed for Sanger sequencing data and that are now applied to long reads like PacBio and Oxford Nanopore. I'm then going to describe the uh, variants of those algorithms that were used for short read sequencing, and I'm describing this in two completely different steps because the, the properties of these data sets are very different, so we need very different assembly methods uh, to handle them. 
So long read assembly pipeline looks like this. We take our sequencing reads from our PacBio, our auction nanopore instrument as input. We then build what we call an overlap graph, which looks for similar pairs of reads and uh, links them in a graph, which I'll describe in a little uh, next slide. We then take our graph, uh, process it to compute a layout of the reads, which is an ordering of the reads from left to right. This describes uh, the contigs of the assembly. We then do the final step, which is called the consensus step, where we pick the most likely nucleotide sequence for each contig, uh, and then output our contigs at the end. So the definition of a contig, it's short for contiguous sequence. It's just a region of the genome that has been assembled back together. It's not going to be, it's unlikely to be the full length of a chromosome, but it might be a few megabases of length if we've stitched together uh, many reads into that content. So the first step of this assembler is uh, finding all overlaps between reads. So just like I, I said, when the fundamental principle of assemblies, we're looking for uh, sequences that share a lot of sequence similarity, where the suffix or the end of one read matches the prefix or the beginning of another read. What an overlap layout consensus assembler is going to do, is it's going to take all of your long reads, take all possible pairs of long reads, align the ends of them, just like BWA is aligning a read to a reference genome, and it's going to check whether there's a significant match at the ends of those reads. If there is a match, it will say great, and will create an edge from one read to the other read in this overlap graph. If there's not a significant match, which is based on a threshold on the overlap length and the number of mismatches it'll tolerate, there's no edge between these nodes. So our overlap graph has a vertex in the graph for every one of our sequencing reads, and edges between any reads that have this sort of relationship where there's a similar suffix and prefix between the two reads. So here's an example overlap graph with an overlap length of three for a handful of seven base pair strings from this original genome that is shown down here. Now, once the assemblers construct this overlap graph, its job is to take uh, this graph and find a path or a walk through the graph which visits each one of these vertices or each one of these nodes that reconstructs this original string. We don't know the, the sequence of this string. We need to figure out from the structure of this graph. Now this graph, even for a very small example, is a little complicated. It's not obvious here whether there's a walk through this graph that reconstructs this original string. So the assembler has to do is it has to uh, pre-process this graph to clean it up a little bit so that it can compute this layout of the reads into the reconstructed genome. So that's the next step of the OLC assembler where it bundles stretches of the overlap graph into contigs. Now to illustrate this, um, what we've shown an overlap graph here for a fragment of a song that says, to everything, turn, 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 there is a season. Now the reason we've selected this uh, fragment from a song is that there's three copies of this word turn in here. And this is representing a genomic repeat where we need to figure out what the copy number uh, of this repeat is. So if we take this string, we break it into uh, seven base pair or seven uh, character subsequences, we construct an overlap graph of those seven base pair subsequences by just looking at uh, overlaps between the, the different fragments, we get a graph that looks like this. This graph is quite messy, it's very difficult to look at, and there's not an obvious reconstruction from just looking uh, at this graph. Now, what the assembler is going to do is it's going to try to infer whether all of the edges in this graph are actually necessary or not. So if we look at uh, this subgraph consisting of these three nodes, there are two paths here. We could go from here to here to here, or we could go directly from here to here via this green edge here. Now, the sequences that are spelled by these two paths are the exact same. So they both spell the word to every with an underscore at the end. This is the same if you go from here to here, or from here to here to here. They spell the exact same sequence, which means 
one of those paths is redundant. It's not necessary to represent it in the overlap graph. And in terms of, of theoretical computer science, we say that this green edge is a transitive edge that can be inferred from the other edges. Which green edge are you using? Uh, can you see the oh, yeah, yeah. up here? So from here to here, it's the exact same sequence as going from here, down here, to here. Okay. So the green edge is a transitive edge, and the blue edges in this example are what we call irreducible edges. They, they're not redundant. So what the assembler is going to do is it's going to search the graph for transitive edges and remove them to clean up the graph and, and simplify it a little bit. So in the first step, we're going to remove transitive edges with this pattern, where there's an edge that goes from this node to this node to this node, and there's an edge that bypasses this middle node. We're going to get rid of these bypassing edges here. So let's do that, and we get a graph that's much more clean in structure than what we saw up here. So we've removed a lot of these transitive edges, cleaning up the graph. Now in a second step, we're going to remove another set of edges, which bypass two nodes. So instead of bypassing one node, these edges go over these two, rather than this chain down the bottom, from here to here to here to here. And again, we get a much simpler graph now, where a lot of the, the vertices only have one edge coming in and one edge going up. And this is exactly what an assembler wants to see, because it's unambiguous what the reconstruction of this part of the genome is. There's no ambiguity. We can just merge all of these chains of nodes together uh, to get our assembled genome. So that's exactly what the assembler is going to do in the layout stage. After it performs its transit reduction, it's going to find these unbranching, these non-branching stretches of the genome and output them as our contigs in the assembly. So we're going to have one contig here that runs up until this branch point. It has a sequence to everything turn. Then we're going to output a contig here. It goes out of this branch point, which goes turn. There is a season. And then the bit in the middle with this complicated branching and looping structure is that unresolvable repeat that we can't assemble. So it's not, uh, it's not obvious from the graph how many times we should put that word turn into our output. So the assembler just gives up at this point and outputs two contigs and one unresolvable repeat. So this is all the assembler is trying to do. It's trying to infer these relationship between reads, find out the stretches of the genome that can be unambiguously assembled, assemble those together, and give up on the repetitive regions of the genome. Now the final step, after it's computed those contigs, is that it wants to calculate what we call the consensus sequence, which is inferring the true sequence of the genome for each one of those contigs. Now the reason this step is necessary is that long read sequencers like PacBio and Oxford Nanopore have a very high error rate, and uh, we need to overcome that error rate when we're constructing our contigs. So what we do is we take all of the reads that we use to assemble the contig, and we construct what we call a multiple alignment of those reads, where we just line up every base from every read uh, into a column, just like we were aligning our reads to our reference genome, and we had this column of all Gs uh, that align to the reference. And then we're going to process this multiple alignment from left to right and take the most frequent base at every one of these columns. So here we've got five Ts. Uh, in our reads, so the sequence in our output genome is going to be T. There's all the reads agree that there is a T here. Likewise, in the second column, we have five A's. All the reads agree we have an A. So we're going to put an A into the output. Now, for the third column, uh, one read thinks that there's a deletion there. It's got a gap, but four reads say that there's an A. So the rule that we're going to use to take to make a consensus sequence is we're going to take the most frequent base in this column and output it into our output. So there's four A's, one gap, so we'd say the consensus is an A, and that goes into the output. Okay, so let's carry on. All these columns are unambiguous here. Uh, if we go to this column, four reads said there was a C, one read said there was a T, we're going to put a C into our output here. Here, four reads said there's a C, one read said there's a gap, and so on, until we've processed every column of this multiple alignment picked out the most frequent bits. Now this is a bit of a simplification. Um, because the error rate of PacBio and Oxford Nanopore sequencing data is so high, 
what the consensus algorithms typically do is they'll take the raw signal that the DNA sequencing was uh, measured, and it will put that raw signal into a probabilistic model that t weights each one of these votes that each read has by the actual base quality score or the inferred probability uh, of that base from the sequencer, which gives it a bit better accuracy uh, in reconstructing this consensus sequence. I'm going to pause at this point and ask whether there's any questions about assembly up to here for long reads. How long can you read? Uh, so for um, PAC bio, the reads are typically between 10,000 and 20,000 bases. For Oxford nanopore, it depends on how you prepare the DNA. We typically go for around 8 to 10 kb to maximize throughput or yield. Um, but there are groups who have taken the approach that they want to maximize the read length, and they've been able to get 100,000 base pair reads up to uh, 500 to 600,000 bases. Uh, but there's a drop off in the amount, number of reads and the total amount of data you get if you shoot for the longest read length possible. Did you have a question? So, so that is, can they um, do the sequencing, I mean, you know, the chopping of the fragments and all that? For RNA seq and for chip seq, it's usually sounded by requirement of sequence, but now we're talking about know, thousands, right? So right. for the genome assembly, it's a completely different set of uh, or a different way of doing it. Yeah, so so typically um so for both between 2010 say and 2015, we typically do no, do de novo assembly using Illumina reads. Um, whole genome shock and Illumina reads, 100 base pair reads. We wouldn't get very good assemblies out of it because of the short read length. So what the field has moved to now is using different sequencers, like not Illumina sequencing, the PacBio and the Nanopore instruments, which can sequence these 10,000 base pair reads, which give you much better quality genome assemblies. And in the, in the pr practical session after this lecture, um, you'll get a chance to do a short read assembly and a long read assembly for the same genome and then compare the two to see how the qualities of the two assemblies differ. Okay, okay. thank you. So the other question I had was, um, when you say a contact, yeah. um, that's after you align the reads and then you finally get this multiple copies for the given section, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the contact? So usually, um, so we usually look at it like generating contacts from this step. So we take our reads, We've now got an ordering of the reads from left to right. We merge our sequences together to get strings that look like this. These are contigs. And then um, this step takes our contig, aligns all the reads back to the contig, and then takes the most frequent base uh, at every position to output the consensus sequence for the contig. So the, the original contig probably has a few errors. It might only be 99% accurate. After the consensus step, it might be 99.99% accurate. Okay, any more questions before I move on? Okay. So we're now going to talk about short read assembly. Um, this is still a very popular thing to do because getting Illumina reads is so cheap. You can sequence even large genomes for maybe a few thousand dollars. Um, and when we first got Illumina data, we, we even tried to assemble these 36 base pair reads that I said gave us so much trouble even mapping them to reference genomes. Um, and unfortunately, the assembly methods that were developed for Sanger sequencing data, which I just described, these overlap layout consensus methods, they completely failed at assembling these short reads. The problem was if you try to find an overlap between 36 base pair reads, the overlap between two 36 base pair reads is going to be very, very short, about maybe 30 bases. Um, and because the genome is so repetitive, you would have this huge overlap graph with hundreds of billions of edges in the graph. Uh, this was completely impractical to build for human-sized data sets. So if you try to use an assembler uh, developed for, for Sanger sequencing data on Illumina data, you would have run out of time, you would have run out of memory on the insert on your, your computer, and it would have completely failed. So what the field did is they took an entirely new approach to assembly, which is based on uh, using short, exact matching words within your reads, which we call k -mer. 
So this is the, the different stages of a short reassembly pro pipeline. There's usually an optional step, which will try to error correct sequencing reads. We'll then build what we call a brown graph. We'll clean up the graph, just like we saw for the layout step of OLC assembly. We'll then find contigs from the graph, scaffold our contigs together, and then optionally fill in gaps at the end. And I'm going to talk about each one of these steps uh, in turn now. So here's a plot of the characteristics of Illumina sequencing data for six different uh, genomes that we sequenced to assemble de novo. I'm going to tell you why I use these six later on. Um, and here's the error rate of each one of these six different data sets as a function of the base position within the read. And for each one of these uh, data sets, we can see the error rate going up by orders of magnitude as you get towards the three prime end of the read. The reason for this is this phasing and dephasing problem that I talked about uh, in the first lecture, where more of these molecules uh, in a cluster get out of sync towards the end of the read. That makes it more difficult for the base caller to resolve what the true base was. Uh, so it makes more mistakes towards the three prime end of the read, up to a few percent, uh, as shown here. Now the problem with this is when we use uh, Kamer based assembly graphs, these sequencing errors bloat the size of our assembly graph and they obscure what the true relationships between reads are. So what a lot of assemblers do is they try to take our, the reads and perform error correction where they want to detect which base in the read is incorrect and then figure out what the true base was at those positions where the read was incorrect. Now a naive strategy for finding sequencing errors and correcting them is to take all of our reads, find overlapping pairs of reads, construct a multiple alignment, and then take the most frequent base, just like we saw for that consensus step. Fortunately, this isn't going to work for Illumina data because, as I just said, finding overlaps between really short reads is, is computationally too expensive. So what we do is we take short fragments, which we call camers. A camer is just a sub uh, word of a read of a particularly length k. We're going to count how many times these camers across, across, uh, are seen across our entire sequencing data set. And we're going to look for camers that are rare, which denote where sequencing errors are, and compare their counts to camers that are seen uh, much more frequently. So let's say we take a, C, uh, a camer of size 20, so K of 20. We're going to slide a 20 base pair window across our read, starting from the first 20 bases, and then starting from the uh, second 20 bases, and so on, until we process the entire read. And we're going to count how many times those camers are seen. Now, we always uh, sequence genomes to quite high coverage. We want 30x coverage, 40x coverage. So the intuition here is that camers that are perfect, that don't contain a sequencing error, are going to be seen about 30 to 40 times, depending on how much coverage we obtain for that genome. But since sequencing errors are quite rare, and they're going to flip genomic camers to some novel sequence, we only should see them one or two times uh, at most. So as we're sliding this camer window across our read, counting the number of times that camer occurs, if we see the count drop down to one or two, we're going to infer that there is an error at that position. That's shown here, where we, we have this function which is counting the number of times this camer is seen. It's perfect. We saw it 40 times. We count the number of times this camer is seen. It has a sequencing error. It's only seen once. We would infer there's a sequencing error which disrupts the camer count. We would then search for fixes of this C by trying A, G, and T. If one of those uh, changes the camer to being a more frequent camer, we would replace that C with the corrected base. Uh, and that would correct that sequencing error. So this is an incredibly popular area of bioinformatics to work on, and there's probably about a dozen different Kamer-based error correctors available with different uh, time and memory uh, properties. So some are faster, some use less memory. So I'll put a listing of some of the most popular ones up here. I think of this list, uh, BFC is probably uh, the best one in terms of time and memory usage. So once we've error corrected our reads, we have a much cleaner data set that we can then use to build our assembly graph. And the way that short read assembly works is based on this idea that uh, a great computer scientist named Pavel Pesner developed, which is called the de Brown graph. 
So as I mentioned, computing overlaps between pairs of short reads is computationally infeasible. So we're going to, again, use k-mers, break our original sequencing reads into k-mers, and then link reads that are adjacent, in a, uh, sorry, link k-mers that are adjacent within a read with an edge. So here's an example of constructing a Brutter Brown graph for k equals 4 for this set of six base pair reads. So we're going to take the first four base pairs of the first read, CCGT. We're going to add that former into our graph as a vertex, which is shown down here. We're then going to take the second former of this read, which is CGTT, and add it into our graph as a vertex down here. Because the former CCGT is followed in a read by CGTT, we link them up with an edge as shown here. Now we're going to do that for all of our reads, adding these formers as vertices and linking up adjacent formers as edges. And then we get this de Brown graph with the structure shown here. Now, this graph has a repeated four base pair subsequence, CGTT, where in one read it's followed by the sequence GTTA, and in another read it's followed by the sequence GTTC. So this gives us ambiguity in the graph, and this is rep representing a repeated former that we would have to resolve. Now luckily in this case there's a unique path that goes from this kamer down to here, follows this lower branch, and then back around and goes here, which reconstructs the, the complete genome sequence. But often, just like we saw in the overlap layout consensus assembly, the assembler is just going to stop at these branch points and output contigs uh, where it's completely unambiguous. Now this might seem like a bit of a silly idea to break our reads, which are short already, into even shorter subsequences, these kamers. But the idea here is that the, the de Brown graph can be constructed extremely quickly, and we don't need to compare all pairs of reads to each other. It can be constructed in time that's linear in the size of our sequencing data set, which for computer scientists is incredibly uh, important property to have when you work with 100 gigabase uh, sequencing collections, uh, like trying to do a de novo assembly of a human genome from Illumina reads. So the next step of the short read assembly pipeline is to clean up any sequencing artifacts uh, from our graph. So there are two main types of artifacts that we want to get rid of. One are what we call tips, which are residual sequencing errors that couldn't be corrected, which give these short spurs or branches off the graph that go for a few nodes and then terminate without being connected to anything else. So the kamers that contain sequencing errors typically lead to these disconnected branches off of the graph. So we have two nodes in a tip here, four nodes in a tip here. Now, as I said, the assembler is going to look for contigs by trying to find these unbranched stretches of the graph and bundle them together. If it sees a branch caused by a tip, it's going to stop our assembly. We don't want that. So in a few slides, I'm going to describe uh, how the assembler gets rid of uh, these branches. Now, the second sequencing artifact that we want to get rid of are what we call bubbles. This is These occur when we have... Uh, a heterozygous SNP in diploid genomes, and their characteristic is a branch uh, off common sequence where one half of the branch follows one allele, like the C allele here, the other branch follows the G allele here, and then they come back together back into common sequence a short distance later. Now again, the assembler, if it's just going to look for branches in the graph and stop content growth, will stop at each one of these bubbles uh, and it will reduce the size of the contigs that we can reassemble. So the assembly field has developed algorithms for get, getting rid of these uh, artifacts, which we uh, refer to as graph cleaning. So here might be a de Brown graph that we've assembled, uh, we've constructed from Illumina reads. Again, the contig structure in this graph isn't very obvious, but we can clean it up pretty simply uh, to improve the contiguity of our assembly. So in the first step, we're going to look for tips. So we're going to mark all of the nodes in our graph that uh, only have a connection or an edge in one direction. We're going to walk backwards until those nodes rejoin uh, the branch point. And then we're just going to remove all those nodes from our graph. 
And again, just by getting rid of these tips with this simple procedure, we end up with a graph that's much cleaner uh, that looks like this. The next step, we're going to look for branch points in the graph, and we're going to look for uh, nodes where those branches rejoin. And that's where these bubbles occur, where we have this diamond structure that branches out and then comes back together. Now the assembler is going to remove heterozygosity by picking one of the two alleles to be the output sequence uh, and removing the other one. And we'd get a structure that looks like this in the graph. Our graph is now a lot simpler and we can start to see the context structure in the graph as these unbranched segments uh, of the graph. So the assembler is just going to look for these unbranched segments, merge them together into these context, and we'd end up uh, with a sequence that looks like this, where each one of these gray boxes um, is our contig. Now, our contigs are typically going to break due to two reasons. Either we hit into a repeat that we couldn't resolve, or there just wasn't enough sequencing coverage um, to make connections in our graph. So when we have Illumina data, which comes as paired in reads, we want to build higher order structures next by scaffolding our contigs together. So scaffolding takes our paired reads, maps them to our contigs, and then looks for pairs where one half of the pair maps to the end of one contig, and the other half of the pair maps to the beginning of another contig. So here we have a selection of blue pairs mapped to the end of this contig, and a beginning of this contig. Here we have red pairs mapped to the end of here, and beginning of here, and so on. And we can build up um, an ordering and an orientation of the contigs using these infer inferred paired end reads um, to say that this contig is followed by this contig in the genome, which is followed by this contig in the genome, this one, this one. We don't know the interleaving sequence. We're just jumping over these unresolved portions of the genome. But at least we can get, say, gene structure uh, in the right order by building these contigs. Now, in the output file, our scaffolds contain gaps, which are these unresolved parts of the contigs, and we typically fill in the gaps with N symbols, which stands for uh, completely ambiguous nucleotides. So we know that there's some sequence there that separates these two contigs. We don't know what it is, so we just put Ns into our scaffolds. Uh, some assemblers will try to then perform a localized de novo assembly with less stringent parameters to fill in these gaps. Uh, other times, if you have complementary sequencing data, like low coverage pack bio long reads, you can use the long reads to try to fill in uh, these unresolved gaps as well. So which do you expect from a genome assembly? Uh, it depends on the size of the genome and the technology that you used to assemble it. For bacterial genomes uh, assembled using short reads, Illumina reads, typically we'll expect hundreds of contigs with 10 to 100,000 base pair lengths. So you'll reconstruct your genome into about 100,000 base pair pieces, and there might be about 50 of them uh, for your assembly. For long reads with bacterial genomes, because the read length is so long and because bacterial genomes typically aren't very repetitive, you can often reconstruct the genome into one single contig that spans the entire genome. Or in the worst case, if there are some long repeats, maybe you'll assemble it into two to five contigs uh, instead. For large genomes, short, uh, long reads give you much, much better uh, contiguity of the assembly. For a short read assembly of, say, a human genome, you can expect on average around 10,000 base pair contigs, which is maybe the size of a gene. For long reads, you can assemble uh, up into megabase sized contigs where you're putting uh, many genes into their right order and orientation uh, in those contiguous sequences. The drawback, however, is that long read data is much more expensive, um, probably by not a factor about 5 to 10. So whether you want to use long reads, um, depends a bit on your question, whether you need a complete finished assembly, and of course whether uh, you have the budget to, to sequence with long read data. Typically, if, if someone asks me for recommendation of whether they should use long read data, PacBio or Nanopore, um, if it's a large genome, I think it's worth the expense just because you get such a better quality uh, reconstruction, as you'll see uh, in the practical coming up.
Okay, I'll take another pause here. Um, any questions about short read assembly or, or anything we've talked to up to this point? So, you fill in the gaps between you can. So uh, typically what the assembler will do is it'll align all the read pairs to the long contigs and it will infer what the, the fragment or the insert size distribution of your paired end data is. And then when it aligns the pairs to these ones that span between contigs, it will um, solve like a, a, a simple maximum likelihood solution to infer what the best size of that gap is. Um, so if you know your pairs on average are 300 bases apart and your read aligns 100 bases from the end of one contig and 100 bases into the next one, you know the gap size should be roughly 100 bases. And if you compare that to uh, sequences of undetermined you're about to say, you finish assembly or finish what you would do on the feature updated over time on screen. Yeah. I guess that over time becomes a combination of different types of data and yeah, the human genome is sequenced with a, a really interesting uh, conservative strategy where rather than doing whole genome shotgun sequencing, they um, cloned the human genome into backs of about 150 KB, made a tiling pack, a path of backs, sequenced the backs individually, and then assembled them together. Um, this allowed them to close a lot of the repetitive sequences because rather than a repeat being globally present across the entire whole human genome, which you get for whole genome shotgun sequencing, the only repeats you get are internal to backs. Um, so the gaps in the human reference genome that are continuously closed tend to be very, very difficult, low complexity sequence, highly repetitive things that even like Illumina reads just don't map, map to these. Um, with Oxford nanopore reads that we're getting 100 KB, 500 KB reads, we're starting to look to see whether we can close some of these, these reference gaps by just spanning over them with an entire Oxford nanopore read. Yeah? Uh, can you explain to me, when you do the KMO correction, yeah. where do the KMOs come from? Is it from a separate sequencing experiment? No, so you, you have your set of reads. Let's say you got a, a billion Illumina reads, right. you break every one of those reads up into camers, and then you put them into, say, a hash table or some dictionary data structure that says, this camer was seen 40 times across my entire read data set. Okay, because that doesn't make very much sense to me. Okay. Because it, what it looks like is you're just taking your same data, yep. rearranging it into a less informative right. form. Right. Like, it's the same issue I have with bootstrapping. Like, I don't understand how that gives you more information if you're breaking it up. Well, it just, by comparing the frequency of cameras, we can detect which ones contain errors. So let's say, let's say we have, um, we've sequenced our genome to 50x coverage. Now, if all of our reads are perfect without sequencing errors, when we break reads into cameras, we would expect every camer to be seen in roughly 50 reads. Okay, because we have 50x coverage, so 50 reads covering every position, and every camera should be seen at, in, in 50 different reads. Now, sequencing errors come in and they take a camera, they flip a random base to it. Now, even though the genomes are very repetitive, if we use a long enough camera size, like a camera of 40, that probably generates a unique camera that's never been seen before. So it takes a camera that was seen 50 times and converts it to a camera that was seen just once. So by looking at the cameras that are only seen very few times, we can de detect which ones contain sequencing errors. So a set of cameras containing sequencing errors are the set that have only been seen once or twice across our entire data set. We then look for random changes to those cameras that convert them from a low frequency camera to a high frequency camera. And then how, how would that be different than just stacking the, all the, the reads up and then looking at each point? It's not different. It's just much more computationally efficient. Oh. Um, if you wanted to, you could stack up all the reads together. It just takes a long, long time. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a, a clever heuristic which gets around the need to align very short reads against each other, which we want to avoid. Oh, okay. So this also mean that just when you pick the K, basically picking a longer one would be 
potentially more extensive? Uh, it's a good question. Um, longer cameras require more memory in, to, to store into a hash table, but you also, um, you reduce sequencing coverage, effective sequencing coverage when you pick a long camera. Um, if you pick, say, the most informative would be taking, let's say your read length is 100 bases, of taking 100 base pair cameras as well. But you wouldn't have a lot of redundancy because no, not many reads overlap by 100 bases. So the camera size is a trade-off between getting a lot of camers that are shared between reads and picking a K that's long enough that you can resolve repeats. This is like one of the magic numbers that goes into genome assembly. It's like, what camer size should I use? Typically, if you sequence to 50x coverage, we use camers between 60 and 70, and, and that works pretty well. But in the next part, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this trade-off between camer size. Yep. Um, when you were talking about tip removal, um, you highlighted the start and end as tips, but then they weren't removed. So how do you right. have this? It's very observant. Um, so usually what you do, going back, you, you'll, you'll initially mark the ends of contigs, the first node in a contig as a tip, as I've done here. Um, and what the assembler will do is it'll count how many steps it has to make to go back to a branch point. And the, the camers that were marked as tips at the end typically have to go much further to a branch point than, one, than the ones that are caused by sequencing errors. So you only will remove a tip if it's very short in terms of the number of nodes back to the branch. So this, um, this one here, you only had to go one step to a branch. This one here, you had to go two steps to a branch, one step to a branch. So the assembler would, would remove all of those because they're what we call short tips. Um, this one probably uh, would be marked as a tip but this is just because this graph is very small. Typically the ones that are at the end of contigs are hundreds or thousands of bases away from a branch point. So you can protect them that way. It's very good. Yep. Does assembly happen while mapping the is happening? Typically they're two different strategies. Um, you'll either, if you have a very good reference genome, you'll just map reads to the reference genome, call SNPs and indels, structural variation. If you don't have a reference at all, or your reference is low quality, you might do de novo assembly instead. Some programs um, do a hybrid of these strategies. So they'll map reads to the reference genome. If the read look very different than from the reference genome, they'll do a local assembly in that region. Um, but typically it's, it's either mapping or assembly. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the last part of the talk now which um, is going to describe some of the difficulties do of doing short read assembly and some of the genomic features that uh, cause us problems. So short read assembly was a very active area of research. Um, there's at least a dozen, probably more like 20 or 30 short read assemblers that have been developed. Um, I wrote three of them, which is a bit of a shame because I never could get it right. Um, and what the community wanted to do was develop methods of benchmarking how the different short read assembly strategies would work um, and comparing them to each other. So uh, there was a project which was called the Assemblathon and the Assemblathon 2, which took three different species which don't have a high quality reference genome, sequenced them, released the results to uh, the community. They would take those sequence sets reconstruct the, the genome as best they could, submit the genomes to the organizers who would benchmark how well each one of those assemblies performed. Um, and the results of this project were a bit shocking because the results were highly variable both across the three different species we tried to assemble and the different assembly strategies uh, that were developed. So what I um, started to think about are different genomic features and different factors about the data that make a given assembly difficult and whether we can help users, people like you, uh, decide how to select an assembler or select parameters for the assembly like this camer size uh, that we did just discussed. So I sat down, I wrote a list of all the things that makes genome assembly difficult uh, and I came up with uh, this list. So something that I've gone on and on about is repetitive sequence. So if your genome is high, highly repetitive, it's going to cause a lot of problems during your assembly. 
If there's high levels of heterozygosity, so a lot of heterozygous SNPs or indels, this causes more of these bubble structures in the graph, which can give uh, the assembler problems. If you didn't sequence deeply enough, if you have low coverage sequencing, uh, your graph becomes disconnected. If your sequencing is biased towards GC rich or GC poor sequences, uh, that can cause problems for the assembler. The classic example that I use here is the uh, parasite that causes malaria, uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which has 80% AT content. It's incredibly difficult to sequence, uh, but because it's so uh, important, we want to be able to sequence it. A lot of work has gone into sequencing and assembling uh, Plasmodium. If your reads have a very high error rate, or if you have a lot of chimeric reads where non-adjacent uh, sequence in your genome has been joined together in the reads, that causes problems. There's a lot of sequencing adapters in the reads. If your sample was contaminated by your genomics core, um, that can look like multiple genomes within your uh, genome assembly graph, which causes issues. Or if you're just sequencing something that's very small, uh, like say a fly, you might not be able to get enough DNA from it, so you have to sequence multiple individuals, and now rather than sequencing a single genome, you're sequencing a population, uh, which also causes difficulty for the assembler. So I wrote a program to assess these different factors and write a report out that the user can uh, look at to see how difficult their assembly is going to be. And the way this program works is that it takes in this de Brown graph uh, and it analyzes the structure of the graph to determine how many errors there are, or how high the heterozygosity is, or what the repeat content is by classifying the branches in the graph into these different groups. So I've come back to this idea of Kamer coverage. Uh, and the first output of this program is a histogram of how many times each Kamer was seen across uh, your sequencing reads. So here's a histogram of 51 mer counts for a human genome sample. We see that there's this roughly Gaussian distribution here centered around Kamer coverage of 30, which re reflects that we had about 30 to 40x sequencing coverage. This is good, this is the minimum standard that we need to do de novo assembly, and we see that we have a very nicely behaved distribution here. Now going back to the question we had about error correction, we see this secondary peak here where there's this high proportion of camers that have been seen just a single time. So this, all of these camers here that are seen a single time are these camers that contain sequencing errors. So the assembler is going to be able to look at this camer count histogram, find all these camers that are seen a single time, classify them as errors, and then try to uh, correct them back to the true genomic sequence. Now, humans aren't particularly heterozygous. There's a SNP every around 1,000 bases. Um, and we see that reflected in this Kamer count distribution. There's this little shoulder here on the distribution, which corresponds to a slight increase of Kamers that have half sequencing depth, which cover heterozygous uh, positions. These are the Kamers that contribute to these bubbles uh, in the genome. Now, not all genomes uh, are this clean. And let's look at the Kamer count distribution for a different genome. So we see something that's quite shocking and uh, as a developer of assembler uh, upsets me in that we see this bimodal distribution in the Kamer counts. <coughs> Here we've, we're showing the Kamer counts for an oyster genome, which has about a 1% SNP rate. So at about 1 in 100 positions of the oyster genome, there's a heterozygous SNP. Now this sh clearly shows up as this bimodal distribution in our Kamer counts, where there's this large proportion of Kamers that have half sequencing coverage that cover heterozygous SNPs. Now, this is an incredibly poor distribution, and if, if someone was to show this to me, I'd, I'd gently advise them that they're going to have a very difficult time assembling this genome from short reads and maybe push them towards getting packed bio data instead. Um, this is indeed what happened with the oyster genome um, uh, Oyster Genome Project, the, the, the organizers of the project sequenced the genome, found there was a very heterozygous, abandoned a short read assembly approach, and uh, used FOSMID sequencing instead. So the next step of this uh, pre-QC program, which measured assembly difficulty, is to classify the branches in the assembly graph and measure the branch rates to assess how often you have SNPs or how often you have repeats in the graph. 
So the way this works is we built a statistical model to examine the coverage at each branch point in the graph and classify them whether they might have come from a sequencing error, would have come from a heterozygous SNP, or they come from a repeat. Now the intuition here is that if you have a sequencing error which causes one of these tips, one of the two branches are, is going to have much higher coverage than the other. So we'd expect one camera to have, say, 40 times coverage, and the other camera to only have one times coverage. Conversely, if it's a heterozygous SNP, we expect there to be balance between the two branches. We expect roughly the two alleles um, of, the, of the heterozygote to have half coverage each. So this just formalizes this notion of comparing the coverage across these two branches to classify which type of branch it is. The program will then emit a report that looks like this, which classifies, which gives you the frequency of branches caused by uh, heterozygosity across the different samples. So here are the six different species um, that we're using for this example report. One is a yeast genome, which is a haploid yeast, which shouldn't have uh, any heterozygosity. One is a Lake Malawi cichlid fish, which was part of this assemblathon project. One was a boa constrictor snake, also part of the assemblathon. One is a human genome. One is uh, a parakeet, which is part of the assemblathon. And then there's this oyster, which I'm using to demonstrate what a very difficult joint genome looks like. And we see the branch rate of the oyster genome as being roughly one in a hundred bases, which is what we expect uh, from the heterozygosity that we saw on that Kamer count distribution. The branch rate of the human genome is roughly one in a thousand bases, which is what we expect when sequencing a human genome. And our negative control here is this yeast genome, which is haploid, shouldn't have any branches. Its branch rate is about one fifty thousand bases, which represents the uh, false positive classification rate uh, of this program. So the user can quickly take a look at this, compare the branch rates, and, uh, and figure out how difficult the assembly is going to be based on the, the heterozygosity of the genome. So you look at this, see the oyster genome is the highest heterozygosity, so it's probably going to be the most difficult to assemble uh, out of these six. The program will also classify repeat branches as well. Here the oyster and the human genome are determined to be the most repetitive. They have the highest frequency of repeat induced branches. We know the human genome is very uh, repetitive. Here the the parakeet in the assemblathon had the lowest repeat-induced branch rate, so it's going to be a little bit easier to assemble than the other. And again, this simple yeast genome, which is only 12 megabases, has a very low uh, repeat branch rate as well. Uh, the program will also predict the genome size as well. Often, you, if you're sequencing a new genome, you might not precisely know what the genome size is. So when you're uh, ordering how much sequencing coverage to get, if you don't precisely know the genome size, you might under or overestimate how much sequencing you need. This program can predict what the genome size is to within about 10% uh, to let you know whether you need to order more sequencing data or not. Uh, it will also do basic quality comparisons like calculating the mean quality score across your reads by position. This gives you a hint at what, uh, where the errors might occur. Here we see that the uh, Lake Malawi cichlid has lower quality scores across most of the length of the read, the data is going to be a little lower quality, some might be more difficult to assemble. It will also directly calculate the per position error rate um, in the reads, uh, and this is the, the figure that I showed earlier on, showing the increase in error rate across uh, each one of these data sets from the 5 prime to 3 prime end of the read. Uh, to assess whether the sequencing data is biased by GC content, it will construct a 2D histogram uh, where each bin is a GC Kamer coverage pair. And what you look for is independence of sequencing coverage across a range of GCs. And this FISH data set is pretty good. We don't see a dependency between uh, Kamer coverage and GC content. If we look at the yeast data, we see a little bit of a dependency where higher GC content has slightly lower sequencing coverage, which is shown by this slope here from left to right. If we look at this oyster genome, we see two blobs on here, uh, one for the homozygous camers, one for the heterozygous camers as well, and we see a little bit of a dependence between uh, camer coverage and GC content. Um, 
The program will also estimate your fragment size histogram if you have paired end data um, by looking for the distance between pairs in the assembly graph. These are for the six different samples. Again, we see that, say, for the snake data set, the fragment size distribution is around 350 to 400 bases. Finally, the, the program will do a simulated assembly um, to help you select the Kamer size they're going to use. So here is um, the length of your contigs as a function of the Kamer size. So for the yeast data, which uh, I've said is very easy to assemble, we get very long contigs across a large range of Kamer sizes. For the other genomes, which are harder to assemble, like the oyster or the human genome, we get much shorter came, uh, contig lengths across this range of K. And we see that for each one of the assemblies, uh, for most of the assemblies, there's this sweet spot where the contig length will uh, hit a peak, and then there's diminishing returns where we get shorter contigs by increasing the Kamer size. And the reason for this goes back to your question where you get lower and lower Kamer coverage as you increase the Kamer size. That uh, increases the fragmentation of your assembly graph, and the assembler isn't able to find uh, long contigs there. Okay, so this program is designed uh, to be quite easy to use. You just need to run three commands to, uh, to run it and generate this PDF report. In the lab that's coming up, uh, I'm not going to have you run the program. I'm just, I've just directly provided the report because it takes about an hour, hour and a half to run. So that would take up most of the lab time if, uh, you ha if I had you run it directly. Um, but here's the commands that are used to run. The software is available on GitHub. Uh, a paper describing it is up on, bio on archive uh, if you want to read about the technical methods. Okay, so this lecture is giving you an overview of how assemblies work. We talked about the different assembly strategies for short and long reads. Um, of giving you the general light recommendation that long read assembly, particularly pack bio, is generally better, but it's more expensive than Illumina sequencing. Uh, and then I've walked you through some of the factors that make assembly difficult and how we can measure them uh, using this program I just described. Um, if you have any questions, happy to take them now during the lab, or uh, if you think of something later on, uh, feel free to just email me uh, with those questions. So before we go into the lab, I'll, I'll, I'll take some questions now. Uh, so this is a cancer genomic sort job. Yep. So are there applications for assembly in cancer research? Because we have references for humans and most of the model organisms. So like, when would you want to use this? So usually, um, a lot of the, the variant callers now are assembly based internally. So a big one that you, you may use for calling SNPs and indels of the GATK haplotype caller. It uses de novo assembly internally within its data structures. Um, so to get an understanding of how that algorithm works, and it's based on the brown graphs, that, that's part of this lecture. Um, we know from sequencing cancer genomes, we miss a lot of structural variation um, and, and large rearrangements, particularly when they occur in repetitive genomes. So something my group is involved in um, and we have collaborated around Toronto, is sequencing using long reads to try to, to figure out where these more cryptic structural variations occur. And there we use assembly-based strategies as well. So right now, for most cancer genomics, you, you'll typically be mapping to a reference, and then the software you use might use an assembly internally, but in the upcoming years, you may be uh, using more and more assembly-based tools. None, uh, so uh, like, is there any difference between what you got from a de novo assembly and, uh, like, the standard reference uh, that you got? Is there, like, a quality difference? Or? Um, at least for human reference, the human reference is very high quality, and it's, you know, billions of dollars have gone into generating and curating human reference. So uh, a typical assembly will be lower quality than human genome. Um, the human reference genome, particularly in terms of base called accuracy, but this, the contiguity of, of long read pack bio nanopore assemblies is starting to approach the contiguity of the human genome assembly. For short reads, the, the assembly would be much, much inferior uh, than, than the human reference. Mm -hmm.